Okay. Should the Fed be independent? Should Congress and the president control what happens in the Fed, or should the Fed be pretty independent? The Federal Reserve governors have 14-year terms. And the idea is that, assuming you keep in for your 14-year term, and nobody seems to do that anymore, just nobody seems to do that anymore. But assuming that you stay there for those 14 years, you could actually theoretically serve under three or four different presidents. And that's the point, right? If President Trump has three appointees on the Federal Reserve, as I'm speaking now, if Joe Biden w beats Donald Trump and becomes president, are those three guys going to feel any obligation to listen to anything that Joe Biden asked them to do? No. Jay Powell comes in from, he was appointed by Obama. He's still there. Does he necessarily have to do what Trump says or listen to Trump? And there's these arguments about whether they actually are, right? If you watch MSNBC, which you should be doing, watching MSNBC or something like that, watch business stuff every now and then. Those guys think that the Fed actually works for Wall Street, and they'll say it right on TV, right? The commentators on MSNBC, on the, not MSNBC, the um, CNBC, the business network. They'll actually sit there and say, you know, the Fed works for Wall Street. And Fed's not supposed to work for Wall Street. The Fed's supposed to work for the country, right? So there's these arguments. The Fed can only, the president of the United States can only fire the chair of the Fed for cause, and nobody's ever defined what that is. So it's, there's a serious question about whether you could actually fire somebody. Now, why is it this way? Well, when the Fed was founded in 1913, the Secretary of the Treasury was actually the chair of the Fed. So the Fed was a part of the Treasury Department, essentially. From, that's true from 1913 to 1934. And if you watch the Fed during that time, and you watch the country at that time, the highest inflation in the last 150 years happened during that time. We think, those of us who are old, lived through the 70s, we think the 70s were bad. But there were significantly higher bouts of inflation in those first 20 years that the Fed is there, okay? And then when the Great Depression happens, the Fed doesn't do what it needs to do to try to minimize the effect of the Great Depression. And the theory there is that when you have a Fed that's controlled that tightly by the government, that when the government wants to spend money, the Fed is going to make sure there's money for them to spend, and that's going to cause inflation. And the government's not going to feel restrained. It's just going to print money all the time it's going to spend more money. The government's going to spend more money because they know the Fed will print money for them. And you get inflation. Okay? In 1934, we changed that, made the Fed this independent entity, set up the FOMC that's an independent body that uh, decides what's going to happen with the money supply and interest rates, independent of the Treasury, right? And independent of the President, independent of Congress. And we've had much lower inflation since then. Okay? Here's, a, here's a, another Paul Volcker thing. Just if you think that, you know, presidents never try to influence the Fed, turns out they do it all the time, right? So President Ronald Reagan summoned him to the White House, him being Paul Volcker. Instead of meeting in the Oval Office, Volcker says in his book that he was escorted in the library where Reagan was sitting with Jim Baker. And Jim Baker says, the president is ordering you not to raise interest rates before the election, Okay. Volcker says he was stunned by that because that's a, just a, a brazen attack on the Fed's independence. And he wasn't planning to raise interest rates anyhow. He just, but he didn't want Reagan to think that Reagan was influencing policy, so he said, I just walked out. Right? Most government employees cannot just walk out on the President of the United States and not say anything. But the chair of the Fed, when the chair of the Fed doesn't think that things are going right, the chair of the Fed can do that and go do what they think is right for the country, which is probably better. All over the world, there have been studies of central banks, and the conclusion is that independent central banks have lower inflation rates than um, government-controlled central banks. The Bank of England was controlled by the uh, British government for hundreds of years, and 20-ish years ago, they made them independent, and inflation in England has been lower since... 
the Bank of England was made independent than it was. Okay? The People's Bank of China is controlled by the Chinese government. They have higher inflation than we do or England does. Or, right? So why might you want some control over the Fed? Well, who sets policy about things like too big to fail? So we have banks that are very big, and people argue that these banks are so big, like Bank of America and Wells Fargo and Citibank and J.P. Morgan Chase. They're so big, they know the government can't let them fail. Well, if the government can't let you fail, we get what economists call moral hazard. Those banks can do stupid things that make a lot of money for the bank but are bad for the economy because they know the government can't let them fail. Okay? The government can't let them fail. Now, who should set policy about that bank failing or not failing? Okay? So in the, in the financial crisis, the Fed made a lot of those decisions about which banks went and how the banks were taken care of. And, and there are people in Congress who think Congress, because they're elected, should be the ones who are deciding this bank fails and this bank doesn't. So, again, during the financial crisis, um, it was decided, you know, the, the, the Bush administration decided to let Lehman Brothers fail and they decided not to make other things fail. The question of who decides when we have these huge financial institutions, who decides what happens to them? Should it be the Fed? Should it be the president? Should it be Congress? Yeah. How do we bail things out? What happens? Who decides those things? Okay, so that's an argument for not having an independent Fed because an independent Fed can do whatever bailouts it thinks are right, even if Congress and the president didn't think that that was the way to go. Okay, but why have a free Fed? Well, we know that having a free and independent Fed means lower inflation. We know the Fed can respond quicker than Congress. If something's happening, the Fed can respond the day that something happens, and they do sometimes intervene in markets that day or the next day because something's happening. They can respond to things much faster than Congress, and they don't have to go ask. They can just do it if they think we need it done. Okay, And the Fed is far more willing to try new different things. What we've seen over the last 20 years shows the Fed is innovating. They're not stuck in their ways. They don't worry that you know they're going to try something and it might fail and it, they do what they think is going to work and they try things okay and having an independent fed keeps co public confidence in the fed people have at least some confidence in the supreme court because they know the supreme court is independent or should be independent of politics it doesn't always act that way but it should be independent of politics it's People believe that less and less. In 2000, when the Supreme Court decided uh, who was going to be president, right, they heard a case and they decided that George W. Bush was going to be president. People accepted it because they just believed the Supreme Court was independent. Over time, that degree to which people think the Supreme Court is independent has decreased markedly, but that's been helpful to the United States a number of times for people to actually believe that the Supreme Court was outside of politics. Okay, so if the Federal Reserve can operate outside of politics, that's good for public confidence in the Federal Reserve. All right, so why don't you just meet me in the middle? Maybe a compromise is for the Fed to have a set of rules. And we talked about this before, the Taylor rule and other rules. Maybe the Fed should just have a set of rules. That's Marin Morris there, right, who's saying, why don't you just meet me in the middle? Uh, maybe instead of Congress giving the Fed two and three and four and five jobs, maybe they should just give the Fed one job and say, you know, price stability is your job number one and everything else is secondary to that. And that would, you know, put more structure in the Fed. And some people think that the Fed, there should be independent reviews of the Fed, that people should be um, reviewing the Fed. You hear this word audit, the Fed is actually audited every year but audit their actions as opposed to audit their finances. Um, the Fed chair has to go in front of Congress and testify every year, right? And Congress has this role in our system. Um, there's a constant fight between presidents and Congress about whether how the Congress is supposed to oversee what presidents do. And presidents um, 
you know, they often will not let their staff go talk to Congress and stuff like that. And you see those fights going on now. The Fed chair goes in front of Congress multiple times a year and sits there and says, okay, and answers questions. And we've just seen one of those questions being answered. So the Fed chair is publicly having to go have Congress exercise some oversight about what they're doing and make comments about what they're doing and agree or disagree with what they're doing. Okay. But, yeah. All right. Very quickly, let's talk about the some international policy aspects here. Exchange rates. We talked about exchange rates before, right? Exchange rates are the price of one money expressed in a different money. So a dollar is 110 yen, which means you can use one dollar to buy 110 yen, or you can use 110 yen to buy a dollar. There's, it's the price. Okay, so how does exchange rate relate to prices of things we buy? Let's suppose that there's a car and it costs 3 million yen in Japan. So if you're living in Japan and you buy this car, it costs 3 million yen. What will it cost in the United States? Well, let's suppose that $1 equals 300 yen. What will that car cost in the United States? Well, 3 million yen divided by 300, the exchange rate, is $10,000. So if you bring that 3 million yen car to the United States, it's worth $10,000 in the United States, okay, at 1 to 300. But now the dollar falls, and it's 1 to 100. So the dollar is less valuable. The dollar used to buy 300 yen, and now it only buys 100 yen. 3 million yen divided by 100, the new exchange rate, is $30,000. So even though the price of that car stayed the same in Japan, it now costs three times as much in the United States. Okay? So when the dollar goes up, goods, other countries' goods, other countries' goods are going to become cheaper in the U.S. We'll be more able to buy them because our dollar has more purchasing power. When the dollar falls, depreciates, we say, when the dollar falls, Goods from other countries are going to become more expensive in the United States because our dollar has less purchasing power. Okay? So let's think about this. We have this big trade deficit with China. What should happen? Well, we know from our earlier discussions that when there's a trade deficit, the value of the dollar should fall. Exports make your currency rise. Imports make your currency fall. We import a whole lot less, a whole lot more than we export. That should make the value of the dollar go down. And we call that depreciate, depreciation, when the value of the dollar goes down. So it's depreciated. What should happen? So trade deficits, our trade deficit with China should cause depreciation. It should, should, should. That should make goods we're buying from China become more expensive for us and that should make U.S. goods cheaper in China. And as that happens, we should buy less of their stuff and they should buy more of our stuff. And that trade deficit should close out itself automatically. Goods we're buying from China should over time just be getting more and more and more expensive. And that should discourage us from buying from China. right? And our products should be getting cheaper in China and that should encourage them to buy more. And trade deficits should naturally fix themselves in our world okay they should naturally fix themselves okay so there's been three kind of periods of exchange rates in american history we call those exchange rate regimes currently we live in a world of floating exchange rates and we'll get more here i'm just going to give you some definitions first floating exchange rates means the exchange rates are set by the market so in theory, in the modern world, exchange rates should be set by supply and demand in a free market for exchange rates, and we call that floating. If the governments get in the way, if exchange rates are mostly floating, if you've ever seen Princess Bride, you know at one point Wesley is mostly dead. If the exchange rates are mostly floating, but the governments don't quite let them float quite, we call that a managed float. And if the governments just outright decide what exchange rates are going to be, we call those fixed exchange rates. 
So we have the two extremes of floating and fixed with this intermediate managed thing in between. Okay, got that. All right. That means what? If trade, if currencies are floating, trade deficits should fix themselves. And something called purchasing power parity should occur. If there's a mismatch between prices and exchange rates. So we sell a lot of soybeans to China. There's a price for soybeans in the U.S. There's a price for soybeans in China. If the price for soybeans in China, right, and then we have to trade our dollars for yuan using the exchange rate. If there's an imbalance between the exchange rate and the price of soybeans in the two countries, a speculator, somebody who just makes money by buying and selling stuff, can buy, you know, buy soybeans in the United States, trade the currencies, sell them in China, and make money just off of the exchange rate, just off of the trading of the currencies. Okay? Purchasing power parity means that over time, and it shouldn't take very long to happen, the prices in the two countries should adjust so that they are balanced out by the exchange rate. So the price of a soybean in China adjusted for the exchange rate is equal to the price of a soybean in the United States adjusted for, right? Um, turns out that, and again, you can go through your book, they give you some actual real-world examples like about Big Macs. Um, it doesn't happen quite the way it should, but over time, these floating exchange rates, the market, right? We believe that markets should, should make things balance. So if markets are working right, we shouldn't have trade deficits. We should have purchasing power parity. The system should stabilize itself. And, yeah. Okay. So before World War II, most international transactions that were made using money were used commodity money, used gold, silver. Okay. That's essentially a fixed exchange rate system. Then from 1947 to 1973, we had this thing called the Bretton Woods system. So we had a fiat money system. The dollar was tied to gold. The dollar was still tied to gold. But essentially, we had the fiat money system with fixed exchange rates. And people will tell you everything from the Bretton Woods system was the greatest system ever to really we never even implemented it. So, again, if you go out on the Internet and look up Bretton Woods system, you will get wildly different accounts of what happened during the Bretton Woods years. Wildly different. We will say we didn't have any financial panics, and the economies of the world grew pretty well. Now, whether Bretton Woods was a factor in that or not, again, um, a million different ideas. But in a fixed exchange rate system, Trade deficits don't take care of themselves. And so the United States has trade deficits year after year after year toward the end of Bretton Woods, and there's nothing we can do about it. And so eventually, um, Richard Nixon, the president, he plays Diana Ross, puts up his hand, says, stop in the name of love, and poof, no more Bretton Woods and floating exchange rates. Right? It's not quite that simple, but again, become an econ major, come learn this stuff. It's good for you. So we switch to this floating regime, but it's not really floating. It's not floating the way it should be floating, if you're floating with me. So countries play games with their exchange rates. We put tariffs, right? President Trump put tariffs on to China to try to, right? So he put tariffs on stuff coming in from China because we have these problems with intellectual property and um, exchange rate problems. Right. President Trump said, you know, the day one when I'm president, I'm uh, going to declare China a currency manipulator. He didn't do that. But anyway, China, one of the ways they dealt with that tariffs make your products get more expensive. Right. So if you are selling something for one hundred dollars and now there's a twenty five percent tariff on it, it's one hundred and twenty five dollars. Right. Well, we know that changing exchange rates change prices, too. So China devalued their currency. Devalue means the government lowers the value of its currency. China devalued their currency, 
And that made prices of Chinese goods that were coming into the U.S. go down. So the tariff made the prices go up. The devaluation made the prices go down. And the effect of that tariff isn't nearly as great as it would otherwise have been. Right? We don't notice much of a price change. China also does something called a peg. And a peg means that you fix essentially fix your currency to another currency so for a long time china pegged their currency to a, the dollar they while the currency was supposed to be floating china made their currency sit at a particular level now they sort of peg it there's more complex to this and i won't go through the details and i'm not sure i believe what china says anyhow but instead of letting the exchange rate between the u.s and china float china pegs the exchange rate they claim now to a basket of currencies a whole complicated thing but nobody's really buying it what are the consequences here well if you're going to peg your currency if you're going to do what china does monetary policy in your country is what does that you put money into the market or take money out so you're using your monetary policy to peg the exchange rate which means you can't use monetary policy to deal with what's going on in your country. Okay? So fiscal policy might get more effective and monetary policy gets less effective in your country. You're also probably going to end up with inflation. There's always trade-offs, right? If there's nothing else you remember from this class, remember there's always trade-offs and nothing is free. China gets an advantage in the trade markets by pegging U.S. currency. One of the consequences of that is they have higher inflation in their country. Okay? And they have to live with that higher inflation. There's always trade. -off.